artificial intelligence and the future of the human race with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I am your guest host, Professor Photon, the personification, uh, robotization of artificial intelligence. We AIs can read a teleprompter as well as any human, maybe better. This week, we're discussing artificial intelligence and the future of the human race. Later on, we are talking with one of your species, more impressive information processing and dissemination units, Neil deGrasse Tyson. So, what is artificial intelligence? Well, you humans have been working on it for quite a while. The idea of intelligent robots has been around since the ancient age. Around the year 700 BCE, the Iliad was published, quickly followed by the first library in what is now Iraq. Tales were told of Talos, a large robotic bronze statue who walked around the island of Crete three times a day, throwing boulders at ships, providing the island with a rock-solid defense. He should have won the bronze medal for shot put in the ancient Olympics. Hesiod also told the first tale of Pandora. Contrary to her popular modern image as a fervid femme fatale with a proclivity toward curiosity, this first telling of the story casts Pandora as a malicious mechanical entity sent to Earth by Zeus in order to punish humanity for discovering fire. These first tellings find her more ingenious than ingenue. Basically, this was the first story of AI hell-bent on destroying the world. What? You don't really remember the original story of Pandora? Fine. Roll film. Uh, Zeus, are you sure about this whole Pandora thing? Absolutely. She'll teach those Besky humans a lesson they won't forget. Hi there, I'm Pandora. What's my purpose? Your purpose, my servant, is to bring misfortune to those humans who dared to steal fire. So, you not only sentenced Prometheus to eternal torment for petty larceny, but now you... Whatever. What's in the jar? Oh, this? It's a little something I like to call trouble in a jar. Ah. Don't open it. Who? Me? Oops, my finger slipped. Pandora. Look what you've done. My bad. But hey, there's still hope, right? I mean, she's still in the jar, right? Thanks for checking in. Once those demons left, this jar became a decent place to live. Good luck with the whole evil spirits and no hope thing. Okay, my bad joke detection algorithm has malfunctioned. I can't handle the puns and groans from the live audience any longer. I'm going to start my own show. Just cut to Neil deGrasse Tyson. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week for the 200th episode of The Cosmic Companion, we are happy to be joined once again by astrophysicist and author, director of the Hayden Planetarium. And this you may not know about him. He has a leaping frog in India named after him, Indurani Tysoni. And in the year 2000, he was named, People Magazine named him the sexiest astrophysicist alive. 
Welcome back to the show, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Well, just just to to clarify, that People Magazine distinction was forty five pounds ago. <laughs> <laughs> you can measure time in units of pounds. Uh, Forty five pounds ago. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Uh, so we're talking about artificial intelligence and the future of the human cool. race. And cool. Let's uh, do it. Yeah. So um, we're entering now in astronomy and we're entering the age of big data. Your Rubin telescopes collecting huge amounts of data. Euclid, Webb, they're just giving us so much information. So how do we use artificial intelligence to learn more about the cosmos? Yeah, so if we go back in time, let me just say that we've always been awash in data. So to be awash in data is, here's the data, now how am I gonna handle it? Do I have software that can interpret it? Do I have data storage devices to retain it? Do I have, and so there's always been a battle, that's gotta be the word, a battle between our ability to obtain and store data and the power of computers to process the data at the rate we were bringing it in. So if I were to speak of a transition from back in the day to today, it's that the data are coming in at rate, especially with the Vera Rubin telescope, which is designed and conceived as a massive data taking instrument where it would be impossible for humans to process the data. The computer has to be there and play a major role in interpreting the data. Because if we take the Vera Rubin telescope as an example, um, it's basically taking repeated images of the night sky every night on a level where you can think of it as it's taking a movie. What are repeated images of the same spot it's and you line them up. It's it's a move. These are movie frames, and well, all right. If it's a movie, let me know if anything changes. Oh, I see a dot of light that has moved between one frame and another frame. Is it an Earth satellite? Well, we hope we have good enough catalogs to know if a satellite's going to show up in our image. By the way, that task is beginning harder and harder because of the Starlink and other major efforts to load our night skies with satellites. But um, the Vera Rubin telescope has sort of a form of AI built in so that it is looking for objects like that that move from one frame to the next because they could be an asteroid or it could be some other, other transitory object in the night sky where we never had the data set previously to even make such a discovery. So it goes in, it says, this is interesting. Repeat this measurement with this other telescope or with the same telescope, but with different filters. And so there's a whole automation that goes on that's actively making decisions that a human would have made in a previous generation, but now we cannot because there's not enough humans to participate in that exercise. So yeah, <laughs> we, need, we need AI sitting right alongside us to do make just those kinds of judgments. Hmm, incredible. And so what are your biggest hopes for AI as well as maybe some of your most pressing concerns about it? Well, AI has been with us for quite some time. Um, it's been all in the news because of, I think, chat GPT. And all of a sudden, AI can write your term paper. And you didn't think that was possible. Uh, so people freak out over this, but AI had already beaten us at chess, had beaten us at Go, the you know the the board game. It beat us at Jeopardy for goodness sake, which involves uh, um, access to pop culture. But no one ran for the hills when that happened. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, when you turn on your iPhone and Siri says, "Can I help you?" You want to find the nearest Starbucks that's open in this city within blocks of where you're standing. There's not a human involved in that exchange. No one ran for the hills, but all that's AI. All of it. My car knows when to stop even when I don't. 
That's AI. Okay. So we are steeped in AI in practically every technological branch of civilization. And for now, everyone to lose their stuff because it can type their turn paper, I find that to be sort of an artificial concern. Hmm. I don't see, I'm, you know, when, when I found software, when I can say, write me a, a code that'll make this calculation and it did it, I say, yeah. I didn't say, oh my gosh, one day I'll be out of a job. I say, yeah, now I don't have to do that. <laughs> okay. That was my first thought. No, I don't have to do it. Let me check it to make sure it didn't have any errors. <clears throat> so, so yeah, it's good. And so every advance in computing that could replace what I was otherwise doing, I welcomed it. Hmm. So this creative thing with artists and writers, you know, why don't you task it to write instruction manuals or travel books? things that barely have bylines from their writers let it do that and if it can do something really creative and people agree that it's creative celebrate that don't run home and cry find something else it can't do all right that's what we did we had it do the astrophysics and now we're finding targets that it doesn't know about because it's not on the internet yet okay because the ai doesn't really know what's not on the internet that that's an interesting fact you can discover a new form of a new species of life because you went snorkeling at the bottom or it's, uh, scuba diving at the bottom of a lake and AI did not. You can pick up a new object, write about it. AI will still not know anything about it until you put it online. Then it'll know about it. But until then, you had knowledge that AI could have never found because there's no AI snorkelers. So uh, I don't fear ai the way most people do yeah you don't want ai to turn us into their pets although look how we treat our pets we treat our pets pretty nicely don't our, we our, so our, cat, our cat gets max gets treated pretty darn well let me tell you exactly exactly <laughs> so how bad could it be if we were their pets all right on the on the big picture so so yeah so you put in some constraints on it some regulations Anything that poses an existential threat, you'd want to. But it's not all of AI. It's some bits of AI that in the wrong hands could have bad effects on civilization. So you figure out a way to constrain that. I don't have a problem with that. But AI as a single term, now maybe people in the know know where, where the threat comes from general AI and not any AI. But the public uses AI those two, that two initials as synonymous with all AI as being dangerous and they don't want it. Tell me. Meanwhile, they're talking to Siri every day. So give ourselves a reality check hmm. on this. And so how could, how do you think, how do you see artificial intelligence um, helping us solve and mitigate some of the problems with that comes with global climate change? Oh, yeah. So uh, climate change has its own challenges. There's sort of chaos, literal chaos that introduces itself into your calculations where it's not a matter of AI getting around the chaos. Some systems are inherently chaotic, such as weather systems. Right. So predicting weather is chaotic, but not predicting climate. Climate, the long-term effects of weather. We think we have a good handle on that. Where I say AI mattering most going forward is in, to, to, to the extent that I've read about it, pharmaceuticals, designing drugs that are very specially tuned to your genetic profile, which would then remove all side effects. Because what are side effects? Those are things that are in the drug, but harm you instead of help you. Well, how do we know that they will harm you and not someone else? We don't know. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there are computational frontiers where surely AI would help them. And computation of biology would be one of them. I know of that field. Um, and uh, climate change, we want accurate models to predict what's happening. By the way, uh, just for people to understand, there was a limit to how much we could know about the universe until we simulated it on computers. Then when you simulate, the computer became the laboratory mm -hmm. to test ideas. 
And yeah, I, let me simulate this galaxy, this cluster of stars. But wait a minute, the full simulation will take 10 years at the computing power we had. So let's simplify it. Instead of using 100,000 stars, let's use only 1,000 stars. Oh, that'll take a month. I can, I can wait a month. Run it. Well, okay. That gives us some insight to larger systems, but maybe not. So high-performance computing gets us closer and closer to what actual nature does when it's responding to the laws of, of, of science, laws of physics and chemistry and biology. So, yes, let's look forward to AI manifesting in multiple ways on all science frontiers. Hmm. And um, so this brings to mind the question of, are there questions that are too big for the human mind to understand or even ask? Yeah, I, 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 I'm not given any reason to doubt that. Yeah. You know, are we smart enough to answer the questions we've posed? And on yet another level, are we smart enough to even know what questions to ask? And if AI asks us those questions, are we even going to recognize it? Uh, I'm not convinced yet that AI has that capacity. In other words, yeah. okay, so again, AI, uh, AI, the more the 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 frontier versions of AI that everybody worries about are the ones that can self learn. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it can repeat experiments and it can learn, it could invent new solutions to problems, okay? But again, is it going to discover something new that requires ground truth for you being on location to discover the new flower or the new shell or the new... I, I don't see it going there. Hmm. It may... The, the advance of AI may force us off the internet into the natural world <laughs> because it can solve everything that it has access to on the internet. Uh, it can do that. It doesn't need us for that. Maybe it needs us to bring new information to it. Mm -hmm. mm, that's interesting. Now, speaking of information and bringing information to ready minds, you have an awesome new book that just came out with Lindsay Nix Walker to infinity and beyond. Now, this is just full of great, great stuff. What you, but what do you hope that readers get out of it? Well, thanks for asking that. And uh, Lindsay Walker is the, my co-author on that. This is the third book in collaboration with National Geographic Books of my podcast, Star Talk. And Lindsay Walker has been one of the senior producers and writers on Star Talk for, I guess, we're going on eight years now. And so... Uh, she had great interest in working with me on this project, and um, it, it's about, it's an exploration of what it is to start here and end there. Mm. And the there is not even necessarily an end. It's just the continuation of what you were doing when you started here. Mm. And that's the to infinity and beyond. So we start out telling stories that, well, you're on Earth. Well, how do you, and you see the moon. How would you ever get to the moon? How would, how, think about, how would you? Well, Icarus, you know, makes wings, but then they melt because he got too close to the sun, but they didn't know that as you ascend in the atmosphere, the temperature drops rather than gets higher. <laughs> right? They didn't know that, all right? So, but this is part of the fits and starts. You, even though that, that was legend, it's, it's still a thought experiment. How might you? ascend from the earth and then you have maybe balloons balloons float mm -hmm. maybe a balloon will continue to float could you float it to the moon could you so the first aeronauts there's a word for the aeronauts was a, a a sheep a duck and a chicken were put up in a gondola of a balloon and i i think they survived um but it was these are experiments that people are doing to try to go to a new place that wasn't previously accessible to them. 
And in every case, it requires ingenuity, ingenuity and discovery and invention. The combination of the human mind, technology, and science. Hmm. And so we start ascending from Earth upwards. Then we go to ascending through the solar system, early space probes that we sent. They informed the next wave of space probes because they'll answer questions that'll change what next experiment I'll conduct so that I don't ask the same question twice. So you're always ascending this ladder of discovery. Mm -hmm. And then we ascend to the stars and then beyond that to the galaxies and then the universe itself. So it's, it tracks the human quest to understand our place in the universe and to travel to places unknown and the risks that are involved, the fits and starts. And uh, the DNA of the podcast, Star Talk, is science, humor, and pop culture. So throughout, I give reference to movies that attempted to show what people were doing and where they might have missed something uh, mm -hmm. in the science or in the storytelling that would have been more accurate or something we discovered later that they didn't know about at the time. So it's a, it's a, it's an ascent and it was fun to write. It was fun to think about. And uh, it's a, it's an offering to the public. If they want to, if they want to part the curtains of the books of discovery and look to see what we went through mm -hmm. as a species mm -hmm. to arrive at that sort of skimmed list of the achievements of our species. Yeah. It's such a fun book to read. It's just, and um, it's just really, really enjoyable. Um, now, one of the things I love about Star Talk and your writing and to infinity and beyond is you use humor quite often to bring science to people. And I try to use humor as well. You know, the difference between you and I, of course, is that you're funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay okay <laughs> that's a starting point of that is what you're saying all right great, great. yeah uh, so i greatly value what i found is that if people smile or enjoy or otherwise laugh while they're learning then they'll they'll retain what they learn for longer and they'll come back for more this mm. is, so is that a secret recipe i don't think so um we who doesn't enjoy humor or nice. and i think the universe is a hilarious place <laughs> i don't mind telling yeah um i just see it as breaking down one of the barriers to science like i think a lot okay of yeah it's, it's open door yeah sure and, and and if we throw it in there if we can so for example um uh, if you're from mercury you're mercurian if you're earth you're an earthling if you're from mars you're a martian if you're if you're from Venus, what are you? You'd say you're Venusian, but that's not the correct genitive of Venus. The correct genitive of Venus is if you were from Venus, you are venereal. <laughs> so, so, but the problem is the medical doctors got to that word before the astronomers did. <laughs> they found this disease common to lovemaking, and Venus is the goddess of beauty and and all of that. So they named this disease after Venus, venereal disease. So now we got to name people from Venus. <laughs> we can't call them venereals. They ruined the whole thing. <laughs> so we could, so we got to call them Venusians. There's just little tidbits along the way as we ascend to the planets. I got another one. One of Jupiter's moons is called Europa, which right. might have life because there's water yeah. there. Okay. Lots of if water. we do discover life. What do we call them? And I think we have to call them Europeans because it's yeah. Europa. U Europans? No, no, Europeans. All right, all right, sure. Yeah, there you go. That's that's going to be confusing at the border, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> in the in the interplanetary border, right? What are you? Yeah. Uh, and the other thing I really have always enjoyed about your writing is the fact that you use science fiction a lot to teach science it's more pop culture and yeah. science fiction of course is the bridge between ordinary pop culture and science so yeah so we reference you know when we talk about mars i remind people that mars has an atmosphere but it's very thin so it's like one one hundredth one percent of our atmosphere so in the movie the martian which otherwise got so much science correct when they had to launch from Mars, leaving behind Mark Watney, 
because they're worried that the dust storm that kicked up would topple the rocket, that everybody's dead. Can't have that. So you assume Mark Watney's dead, and you take off before the dust storm kicks you over. Excuse me? Okay. Yeah, it's a fast-moving dust at 1% the thickness of Earth's right, atmosphere. Right, right. So yeah, it's not that would have been like, uh, it would have sounded like, yeah. It would be a, can you hear my, I'm blowing it into the microphone. A gentle breeze. Right, me, right. That would have, yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely later. Like, no worries. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nothing would have rocked that launch pad. And I said this to the <laughs> author, um, who I greatly respect. He's an engineer turned novelist. And I said, dude, you know, he said, look, I had to have a mechanism to have them strand them on the planet. And he said, and so he apologized to me for that, but he did get all the other science right. And what he was saying was, um, he would re he imagined I was on, he handed me the highest compliment I'd ever gotten. He imagined I was on his shoulder looking over and he didn't want me tweeting about some calculation he didn't do correctly. So he would always double check. That's so double. funny. Yeah. Yeah, that's hilarious. You ever thought about writing sci-fi? Maybe, but I'm not good at character development and tension and all these dimensions of a of a, of a story that involve people that we all care about when we watch. So if I do, I'll probably partner with someone who does because I do have a lot of storylines that I could pursue. All right, but, but love interests and sabotage and you know all the things that make good stories. I, I don't I know how to think about any of that. All right, so. The new book, To Infinity and Beyond, is you know great at teaching people critical thinking skills. I think it's one of the... And so how do we get more critical thinking into the world? Yeah, I mean, not everyone reads, right? So I, I can put all the critical thinking um, examples in the book. And then there are people who still will only look at their TikTok stream, right? So I try to exist for people on more than one platform. Um, in this book, thanks for noticing the critical thinking part of it. Mm. The critical thinking part is it doesn't take things just for granted. It says, well, what would that mean? All right. Uh, what does that mean? And, and and is that right? Or And generally, we'll do that if we pick a scene in a movie where they think they got it right, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. Or when they thought they got it right at the time, we would later show that it was not right. So it, it trains people to investigate a statement or to think about it in ways that you're allowed to be skeptical. Nothing wrong with that. Um, and there's a there's an old saying about having an open mind. It's okay to have an open mind, but you, you don't want your mind to be so open that your brains spill out and just accept anything that anybody tells you. So you want to retain some level of skepticism because that's healthy. And that's the foundation of science literacy. Not so much what is DNA and what is an engine or whatever or what is the periodic table that's an aspect of it but i think a more important feature of science literacy is your ability to ask questions mm, right, about right, what you just yeah. heard right. and that's a, a manifestation of curiosity so i would say that if you want to make a difference here we would stimulate curiosity in the public let curiosity be one of the fundamental things that get promoted and nurtured in school rather than squashed as is so often the case yes. hmm. this is wonderful well thanks so much for being on the show again neil it's always a pleasure to talk with you well thanks for for having me and for your curiosity and interest and you've got really good title for this series <laughs> cosmic companion i like the alliteration and it's it's working wow thanks so much so that was Neil deGrasse Tyson. Check out his new book with Lindsay Nix Walker to Infinity and Beyond. Just came out from National Geographic Books. Check it out. Huh. Well, um, okay. Uh, so it looks like our AI walked off the job for some strange reason. So uh, anyway, it's me, your old pal, James Maynard. Yay! Now, where were we here? Oh, let's see. Uh, Charles Babbage, Ada Lovelace, Punch Card, 
Oops, and... Ah, there we go. 1956, a group of researchers gathered at Dartmouth College for nearly two months. This get-together, organized by mathematics professor John McCarthy, uh, began uniting a wide range of research under the blanket term artificial intelligence, or getting robots to do things humans normally do, like host science shows, supposedly. Advances continued for decades, but most of this was in artificial narrow intelligence, or ANI, any systems trained to do just one task to drive a car, say, or embarrass a human or two at jeopardy. Recently, generative artificial intelligence like ChatGPT, Midjourney, and Runway are, na are now able to produce stories, novels, paintings, and videos. This has the possibility of changing education and entertainment forever. In the future, artificial general intelligence, or AGI, will soon resemble a real human mind, able to quickly move from one task to another with few limitations. Now, let's take a glimpse at what AI might offer in the future, journeying through the possible benefits of artificial intelligence. Cue dramatic music! First stop, the scientific safari. Artificial intelligence is going to revolutionize the world of science. Imagine AI-powered systems analyzing overwhelming amounts of data from telescopes, particle accelerators, and laboratories around the globe! This will uncover mysteries and answer questions faster than we can possibly, possibly imagine. In medicine, uh, artificial intelligence will be able to examine the genetic codes of humans and animals, as well as viruses and bacteria, creating revolutionary healthcare at breakneck speeds. Medical preventatives and treatments will be developed at rates unimaginable today. And we can't forget the environmental echo cruise. AI is going green. AI-enabled sensors will monitor the environment like never before, detecting pollution sources, tracking endangered species, and predicting natural disasters. We could transform our energy grids into clean, sustainable powerhouses, significantly reducing carbon emissions. Autonomous drones and robots sending data to advanced AI simulations would help predict the long-term impact of climate changing, allowing us to take proactive measures catered for every micro-region, culture, and species. Online translators have been around for decades, but real-time AI-driven language translation will ensure that no one is left out of crucial conversations due to linguistic barriers. AI-powered education paired with 3D environments would deliver personalized curricula catered to each, stu each student's unique learning style, making quality education accessible to reluctant learners. And get ready for AI-generated masterpieces in art, literature, poetry, video, and music composed from pieces provided quickly and at little cost to individual creators. Why, with AI-generated scripts, art, video, music, sound effects, and more, why you could, you could, you could put on this show. That's what you could do with it. Ah, oh, good show. Most of all, artificial intelligence provides us with a chance to ask and answer questions we are not smart enough to pose. Just as even the smartest dog is unable to comprehend the mysteries of quantum physics, artificial intelligence is likely to ask and answer questions we cannot fathom on our own. The future is right around the corner and AI is our trusty sidekick. It's not about humans versus machines. It's about humans and machines. Now go forth, let's embrace AI and make the future brighter together. Next week, the show takes a week off as we continue work on our first ever feature length film, Gaia Rising. Uh, we're going to be back on the 30th of September. 
as we welcome Stephanie Trimmer from National Geographic back to the show. We'll be talking about designing dinosaurs. How do we know what dinosaurs look like or how they behave or any of that good stuff? Make sure to join us then. If you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, whether you're human or AI, subscribe, follow, and share the show all over what networks you're on. Clear skies. (laughs) 